Well, good morning, good morning again. We are, can we just say it again? We are so glad to have you here with us. And if this is your first time being here with us at Lake Country Church, we want to tell you you're indeed our special guest. Uh, I know that we are about to, for many, starting back to school. I know some started back on Thursday. I know more are starting back tomorrow. And all the parents said, amen, amen. amen. That's right. But we are, we are, we're so glad you're here. Those that are joining us online, man, so glad to have you guys as well. You came, if today is your first day, you came at a great time because we are finishing up our summer series. Our summer series has been over the book of Genesis, and then the name of the series is called Origins. And Origins, that's actually what Genesis means, is Origins. And we've been telling the stories about the book of Genesis, because here's the deal. The stories are important. Before everybody had their Bibles everywhere and had their NIVs and their King James Version, it was oral. Everybody was telling the stories, and that's why it's so important for you and I to know the stories inside of the Word of God. And the book of Genesis is packed full of those stories. We started the entire summer starting with creation and with Adam and Eve. We looked at the story of Noah. We went to the Tower of Babel, and then we started looking at this one individual that God basically said, look, you're going to be my guy. You're going to be my guy. I'm going to work through you because I see your faithfulness. And his name was Abraham. And God said to Abraham, I'm going to give you more descendants than there are stars in the sky, more descendants than there are grains of sands on the beach. Problem was is that Abraham was old, and Abraham and his wife Sarah, not only old, but they were without children. And here's God making this kind of promise. But what's impossible with men is not impossible with God. And so God ended up giving them a son. So we've got Abraham. we got Isaac. Isaac then, when he was ready to marry, he looked at dad and said, Dad, go find me a wife. I don't know how many people in this room could do that same thing. To be able to look at my dad and say, Dad. Go farm it. No, it was not going to happen. So we got Abraham. We got Isaac. Isaac ended up marrying, and then they ended up having two sons, Jacob and Esau. The bloodline is going to go through Jacob. So we got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And Jacob is going to have an encounter with God, and God is going to change his name to Israel. He said, you'll no longer be called Jacob. You'll be called Israel. And Israel ended up having 12 sons, and those are going to be the 12 tribes that God works through. Now, the second to the youngest was a man named Joseph. And Joseph is who we've been looking at for the last couple of weeks. So we had Abraham, we had Isaac, we had Jacob, now we've got Joseph. Joseph... If you remember from last week, if you weren't with us last week, I hope you'll go online. Go to YouTube, go to Facebook page. You can listen to the message, talk about the test. But from there, what we end up seeing is that Joseph has got a blessing that God has in store for him. Can I speak this over you right now? God not only has a destiny, God has blessings in store for you. Now, some people could sit here today and say, well, Scott, that's prosperity gospel. No, that's the word of God. And the Word of God says, listen, you know, you know why God wants to bless? Can I just say this real quick? Because he's a dad. He is a father. Is it not a wonderful thing as a father to be able to bless your sons and your daughters? And God has, listen, if we as earthly people, earthly dads know how to give good gifts, how much more does our heavenly father who's in heaven? So God desires to bless, and he desired to bless Joseph. But understand this, if you are not equipped, if you don't have the character to hold the blessing, the blessing won't be a blessing, it will be a burden. So God took Joseph through these different tests. And at the very end, Joseph went, <laughs> he went from a pit to Potiphar's house to a prison and ultimately ended up in the palace being second in command just under Pharaoh. And it was now at this point that Joseph has his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. 
And what we're going to talk about today as we finish this series, we've talked about with Joseph, the dream, the test, and we're going to finish with the legacy. My desire, God's desire for you is that you leave a lasting legacy. I know that um, household I came from, you know, I had four different dads in my life, all right? And I can remember being in college, I'd just given my life to Jesus. And I was excited about God. I wanted to grow as a disciple. I wanted to follow Jesus. And in class, we had an assignment to draw out your family tree. And I can remember all these other people would get up there, right? All these other Christians, they're like, well, this is my dad, and he's a pastor of this church. And then my great-grandfather, he was a bishop. And then this guy, he was an archbishop. I mean, all these godly family trees. And I'm sitting here, you know, going, well, I, I got most of my information off the TV show Cops. Because that's where most of my family came. Right? And I got to be honest, I, don't, I, don't, I know there are some of you in this room, you got this godly family tree, God bless you, and that's great. But there's some of us in here, we just came from a rough family tree. In fact, I always say, I don't have a family tree, I have a family bush, right? It was just, it was, it. And, I, and I did, I, I felt kind of defeated because here were all these people with these godly families, these godly family trees, and I'm sitting here just going, and I remember saying this to God, God, I don't have a godly family tree. And Holy Spirit spoke so clearly to me and said, then start one. Then start one. Can I say this to the outlaws of us that are in this place? You don't have a father who was a deacon. You don't have a great-grandfather who was a bishop. Can I, can I say to you real quick? Let's you and me start one. So today we're going to talk about what, how, how, how does that work? What does it look like to create a godly legacy? And so this morning I'm going to invite you guys, if you'll take out your Bibles, if you've got those with you this morning, you got your Bibles with you this morning? You got those? Hold them up real quick. I always love seeing this in the room. Beautiful, beautiful. I want you to turn over. We're in the book of Genesis. That's the very first one, okay? Very first book. And we're going to be in chapter 48. In chapter 48. Now, as you're turning there, let me hit this real quick. Because whether I'm talking to grandparents in this room, and you're sitting here saying, what kind of legacy will I leave with my children and my grandchildren? Or whether I'm talking to parents in this room, and you're looking at your kiddos going, man, will my children learn to fall in love with Jesus? Will they follow God? Or whether you're here today and you don't have any children yet, Today, this message is for you, but I want, you, I want to start with this. I want to start by letting you know that in the same way that there is a God who looked at you and gave you freedom of choice, God's going to do the same thing with your children and your grandchildren. I, you, you can sit here and you can look at some of the most godly people in the world, people in love with Jesus, sold out for Christ, and go, but their kids rebelled. What happened? One of my heroes of the faith passed away a few years ago, Billy Graham. Love Billy. And here's Billy, man, traveling the world, telling more people about Jesus Christ than anybody in history. But yet Billy Graham has got a son rebelling from God. His, his name was Franklin, and, and Franklin Graham in his book, uh, Rebel with a Cause, he talked about this. He said, I believed in God. I just didn't want Jesus running my life. I wanted to run my own life, but I was miserable. And even as a teenage boy, here's Billy Graham. Billy Graham! His son is getting kicked out of reform school for drinking and smoking and just rebellion. So I want you to hear this again. We can tell our kids about Christ. We can show them Jesus, but you can't force your children, your grandchildren to Christ. But you know what you can do? Give them the best image of Jesus possible. Live 
a life with such integrity and live a life committed to Christ that it will mess your kids up. This morning, as we look at this, look at Genesis chapter 48, verse 1. We're going to dive into this chapter, and then we're going to pull out the nuggets that talk to us about what does creating a legacy look like. So the scripture says this. It says, sometime later, Joseph was told, your father is ill. Okay, y'all remember Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob to Joseph, and now we got the two grandsons coming in. Sometime later, Joseph was told, your father is ill. So he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, along with him. When Jacob was told, your son Joseph has come, Israel, notice they're already calling him Israel here instead of, instead of Jacob. Israel rallied his strength, and he sat up on the bed. Verse 3, Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me in Luz in the land of Canaan, and there he blessed me. And he said to me, I'm going to make you fruitful and increase your numbers. I will make your community of peoples, and I will give this land as an everlasting possession to your descendants after you. What is he doing? What's, what's Jacob, what is Israel doing right here? He's simply doing this. He's telling them the stories. Jacob is sitting here and he's just reminding his son of the stories. You see, I, being a preacher, I mean, I, I tell the stories all the time. And I thought, as a dad, I told my sons and my daughter, I thought I told them all the stories of all my life. I know I had to at least tell them the different stories at least once. But then, I was so blessed with Renee's dad, Wilson. And Wilson's this little portly guy, and, and he, he went home to be with Jesus about a year and a half ago. And, but I would sit with Wilson, and, and after whatever sports game was on, went off. And after Wheel of Fortune, went off. Then the TV went off. And you know what we did? He told stories. He told the stories. I, I, I know some of y'all, maybe as, as teenagers, your parents are going, hey, get in the car. We're going to go see so-and-so family. Kids were asking the question, what, 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 what are we going to do? <laughs> and normally the answer is this, we're going to visit. Right? That, that's the answer. What it, I don't even know what that means. We're going to visit. You know what that means? We're going to share the stories. And I can remember sitting down with Wilson and Wilson after the game and after Wheel of Fortune TV went off and he would just tell the stories. And can I tell you something? I would hear some of those stories over and over again to where I eventually knew the stories. Can I tell you, part of having a house that leaves a legacy is tell the stories. Turn the stupid television off. Put the phone screen down and tell the stories, there's so many stories, because I thought I did, I really did. I thought I told my kids all those stories. I thought I told my kids the stories of, <laughs> you know, how when I just given my life to Jesus, and then that summer I thought for sure I'm gonna go into this certain ministry, this singing ministry, and God closed that door, but he opened this other ministry that gave me the opportunity, my senior summer, man, to start teaching and preaching. I know I told him that story. Did, did, did I tell him the story? Did I tell him the story about man, the junior year of high school, how I got kicked out of school, and then the senior year of high school, I was so ticked off, I went back to that high school, and I burned down their bond. I know I told them that story. Did, 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 did I tell them the story about when my grandfather had that $2,500 poodle, and I gave it a haircut? I know I, I, I know I told those stories. So can I tell you this? If you're going to have a house of legacy, tell the stories. Tell the stories. Another one. If you take a note, man, jot this down. Don't just tell them the story. Mom, dad, you listening? Tell them the salvation story. I know we got parents. I know we got grandparents. You want so bad to see your kids come to Jesus. You want so bad to see those grandkids come to Jesus. Can I ask you this? Do they know how you came to Jesus? Do they know your story? 
My story was I was a church brat. I was raised in church. Man, I made 8,000 crosses out of popsicle sticks. I was a Sunday school brat. Man, I made Joseph in the coat of many colors with a little puppet. Don't fall on the wheel. Oh, I, I was there. And I knew about God. I knew the scriptures. I knew the song. I, I couldn't read music, but I knew every hymn. In my eighth grade summer, our church went on this, this choir tour. And I wasn't supposed to be able to go on it because I was eighth grade. But I was the only one small enough and had the pipes to be able to sing this one part in this musical. So they said, Scott, you want to go on this musical? All the high schoolers were going. No junior hires were going. I was the only one that got invited to go. Scott, do you want to go? I'm like, dude, let me pray about it. Yes. <laughs> and I got to go. And I can remember being on that church trip, and we were in Helena, Mississippi on July 16th. And I can remember we had these two little old ladies in our group who went on the choir tour with us with all these teenagers, right? That's some brave women. And these two little old ladies, we described them as, dude, they, they were in love with Jesus. They were incredible. They were Jesus and wrinkly skin. That's all it was, right? And we got to Helena, Mississippi, and there'd been a lot of just trash talking, everybody getting ugly on the trip. And these two little old ladies, they looked at all the girls. They said, we want all the girls out of the bus, go to this room. Girls get out of the bus. <laughs> Dudes, we're ticked off because that means we got to set up everything by ourselves. <laughs> Still to this day, I don't know what happened. Except to know that when those girls got into that room, the presence of God just started dropping. And those girls just started weeping and they started confessing sins one to another. And when they opened those doors, it was like the presence of God, like a rushing wind, just shot out of that room and hit everybody in sight. And that night, that was the night that I knew there was a difference between being in church and being in Christ. And that night I did. That, when we, performing this musical, when we gave the invitation to come and meet Jesus, I was the first one to turn around and just raise my hand. I dropped down on my knees just weeping. I prayed everything that I could think of to pray. And it was that night in Helena, Mississippi on July 16th that I moved from just being God's creation to being God's child, his son. Tell the story. Tell the salvation story. Can I tell you this? You want to create a house of legacy. Tell the stories. Tell the salvation stories. But do this also. Tell the dreams. Tell the visions that you've got. Tell them the dreams. Have you told your kids, your grandkids, have you told them about promises that God has given you? Have you told them about visions or desires that are inside of your heart? Have you shared with them those things? For me, I can remember so well, we were, we were building a brand new sanctuary. We had, the church was growing and people were coming and receiving Christ and getting delivered, healed, set free. And church was just starting to pack out and we had to build a bigger building. And I can remember walking in. It was nothing, the walls weren't even up yet. Just metal and concrete. I remember walking in there and standing on what would be the platform. And I could see. I could see giving an altar call. And I could see people coming down both aisles to where the whole front, this is just in my mind. I could see the whole front just being packed with people and there were people going halfway back the aisles Coming forward to say, I want this Jesus. That was a vision. That was a promise. Two months after we moved into the facility, that's exactly what took place. We gave that altar call two months later and the place packed. I tell that to you to say, do your kids, do your grandkids know the promises? Do they know the visions that you've got in store that God has placed inside of your heart. The scripture goes on and it says this. So I tell you, tell them the story. Tell them the salvation story. Do they know how you came to Jesus? And then tell them the visions. 
Tell them the promises. Verse 8. When Israel saw the sons of Joseph, he asked, who are these? They are the sons of God that God has given me, Joseph said to his father. So here's Jacob, here's Israel. He's old, he's, his eyesight's getting bad. He's there in his bed and he sits up as his son Joseph comes in. Joseph is bringing his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And Jacob asked this question. It's a really interesting question. He goes, who are these? Can I speak this to you today? When it comes to your children, they don't belong to the government. It's not the government's responsibility. They don't belong to the school. Thank you, Jesus, EMS. Thank you, God, that we've got some godly leadership around here because as I read the news it just gets scarier and scarier about our schools but can I say something to you even with good schools here in EMS the school is not responsible for the godly training of your children your children God has said here, so here's the question whose children are these and what's the first thing Joseph says these are the children God gave me so in other words, these children, I've already given them to God. I've already dedicated them to God. In fact, at the end of this month, we're going to have a time where we've got some parents who want to come up here, and they want to bring their children and say, God, there's going to be a day when this son, this daughter, they receive you. Their eyes are open like July 16th in Helena, Mississippi. But God, I want you to know right now, I'm dedicating this child to you. This child belongs to you. So one, I know where that child comes from. So two, I also recognize the responsibility that I have. We as parents, Joseph is acknowledging these children came from God. But these are the children that God put in my responsibility. Grandparents, can I say to you? Man, you may, you may have some hardcore little rugrats, right? You may have some ragamuffins, some ankle biters. And God gave them to you. So see, we got our three sons. We got our dudes. Right? It was a dude house. I loved having a dude house. But it wasn't until God said, okay, after dude number three, Scott, I trust you enough. I'm going to give you a dudette. I'm going to give you the girl. So we had boys. We knew what boys looked like. We're going to break things. We're going to break that vase. We're going to break that cat. We're going to break this arm. I mean, they, there's, we're going to break things. So we're so excited for a girl. It's going to be a precious little baby girl. And God gives us Claire. My father-in-law, Wilson, that I told you about, said, this is the squirmiest baby I've ever held. This is a daughter of thunder. And I can remember seeing Claire because Claire had just, she had such thick hair. We call it cave girl hair. And Claire was just, and I remember, listen, can I say this to parents, grandparents, listen to me, listen to me. I was about to start praying, God, you got to get a hold of this girl. You got to change her. Something's wrong. <laughs> right? Come on. Some of y'all know, you, you know the child I'm talking about in your house. <laughs> And God got a hold of me. He says, Scott, don't pray that I'll change a daughter of thunder. Pray that I will make you a dad worthy of a daughter of thunder. Amen. So see, I recognize there are no accidental children. Can I say that real quick? Because there may be some of us in this room that are going, yeah, it was kind of an accident. No, no, no. God is the giver of life. There is no th such thing as an accidental child. There's just accidental parents. Somebody catch that? So when God gives you the gift, grandparents, of that grandson, that granddaughter, guess what? God doesn't roll dice with the universe. He handpicked you. Mom, Dad, I want you to understand something. When you look at that son, that daughter, and you're about to pray, God, you got to change them bad. First pray, is there something you need to change in me? Because for Joseph, he understood that there was a responsibility, and the responsibility does not fall on the government. The responsibility does not fall on the school. The responsibility does not fall on society. It falls on us. And so we start with 
God, I know this gift is from you. Once again, the responsibility to the child, but also, stay with me. I not only have a responsibility to my children, I have a responsibility to my God where that came from. You see, there's something special about knowing that it came from God. I've got a vase in my house. I'm not a vase guy. I don't even know if I'd call it a vase. I think it's a vase. And I got it from my brother. On my, from, from our wedding, for our wedding. So 36 years ago, my brother got me this very expensive vase. Don't really care about a vase, but because it came from my brother, it's kind of important to me. 36. 30, I've had that thing for 36 years. I have broken everything that I've owned for 36 years. I've got that vase. You know what else I got? My dad. I got his single shot shotgun 12 gauge and i don't even know if there's a rubber stop on it you know it, it's gonna kick you like a mule but you know what i got it scott that gun's kind of worthless not to me because i know where it came from can i say that about your kids can i say that about your grandkids to be able to look at them and see them understanding where they came from they came from the father they're your vase. They're your vase. For some of y'all, they're your shotgun. But <laughs> bottom line, they're from God. Scripture goes on. Come on, we're, we're not through here. Verse 9, they are the sons of God. This is, this is Joseph responding. They are the sons God has given me here. Joseph said to his father, then Israel said, Jacob, right? Israel said, bring them to me. Why? so that I may bless them. Listen to me. If you want a house that will create a legacy, three things, three things I want you to be able to see. One, be a family that knows how to behold. Be a family that beholds. In other words, be a family that sees. What is it that I'm gonna see? You need to see that they're a gift from God. The scripture tells us in James, it says, every, say every, every. say every. every, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. So if you're going to have a house of legacy, you've got to be able to behold, you've got to be able to see that that son, that daughter, that grandson, that granddaughter comes from the hand of God. But then this, you need to also see this. Second thing that I want you to be able to see is not only is it a family that sees, beholds, but it is also a family that believes. You need to believe in that son. You need to believe in that daughter. Can I tell you something? Used to be with a pastor, and he's an incredible encourager, fantastic encourager. In fact, in my opinion, one of the best encouragers there are out there preaching. And I remember asking him this question. I was like, dude, you are always preaching these encouraging sermons like week after week after week. And he looked at me and he said this. He said, Scott, out in the world, people are tearing you down wherever you go. He goes, you go to work, you get torn down. You, you can be at home and you get torn down. You get torn down all over the place. There's got to be a place where people believe in you. He said, that's the kind of church I want to build. We have got to be a people that for our sons and our daughters, we believe in them. But Scott, they're acting like hellions. Scott, come pray with me. Pray, help me cast this thing out. You got to see what God sees. You need to see what God sees. I told you, I told, I told you my grandfather was one of those people who believed in me. When I was a little ADD kid, just my grandfather believed in me. My grandfather loved me. Now, my grandfather loved, adored my grandmother. And he bought her a $2,500 poodle. And it wasn't one of those big guys. It was a little bitty thing. It looked like a rat with a perm, you know? 
And he bought her a $2,500 poodle. And I remember my grandfather and grandmother were going on vacation one time. And my grandfather asked my mom, will you guys watch the dog? My mom said, we'd be glad to. We already had a dog. It was an outside dog. We had a dog. Now, you need to hear this part of the story because this is very important for the story. They dropped the dog off. And as my grandmother and grandfather got in that big old Cadillac car and were backing out of the driveway, I did run outside for the record. I ran outside and asked my grandfather, can I give the dog a haircut? To which my grandfather goes, you bet. Drives off. We have the facts established here. Good, let's move on. So what did I do? I took that little, man, that little sponge and that little SOS pad with hair, and I went out into the backyard, and then I went in to my bathroom underneath the sink. That's where my dad kept the electric shears that he used to give us buzz haircuts with. But if I ever do anything, I always research it out first. So underneath our television set, I'm going to date this, and some of y'all are going to know where, where I live, was the encyclopedias. Remember this? Youth will explain later. And under A, <clears throat> A for animals, there was a picture that I'd seen many times. It was a picture of a poodle with a really cool haircut. It was this big old white poodle and had a big full chest of hair and then real tight, you know, waist right here. And it did the coolest thing on the legs. Ball of fur, trim down, ball of fur, trim down, ball of fur. And you know what? It even did it on its tail, too. Ball of fur, trim down, ball of fur, trim down, ball of fur. And I was like, that's the haircut I'm going to give my dog. So I took those shares. I took that stupid dog. I took my encyclopedia. I went out into the backyard, plugged it in. I went to town. Now, there are a couple of things I wish I would have known. First off, on the picture that I saw, this is what was called a giant poodle. On the legs, ball of fur trim down, ball of fur trim down, ball of fur. My dog didn't have enough leg. So it was just slick, ball of fur. So when I got through with him, he did look like a little Clydesdale. <laughs> just kind of print. The, the other thing that I wish I would have known was in their picture of the giant poodle where the hair was trimmed down, there was still hair there. Not on my dog. It was slick like a rat. So here he was with this big old bushy chest, slick rat legs, ball of fur, and then even the tail, there wasn't enough tail. Come on, folks, there was not enough tail to do ball of fur, trim down, ball of fur, trim down, ball of fur. So it was just slick like a rat, ball of fur. I got through and that dog is just running around the backyard and my mom walks outside. Sees the dog. Looks at me. Looks back at the dog. Walks over to me, puts her arms around me and goes, we'll miss you. Look, can I tell you something? I wasn't scared. You know why? I knew my grandfather. Now, see, I don't want you to hear something. My, my, my grandfather wasn't some worst guy. My, my grandfather was one of the original police officers in San Antonio, Texas. <coughs> grandfather was a pretty thick guy. <coughs> now, I will tell you, I do remember the day they came back. That big old maroon Cadillac came driving into the parking lot driveway and needless to say I was the first one outside he needed to hear my side of the story first <laughs> but dead damn it right behind me was that stupid dog <laughs> now my grandfather was a big guy so it took him a moment to get out of that car that head had to get out and then that big old body and I remember him standing up like he blocked out the sun and the first thing he sees is that dog and then he looks at me. He looks back at the dog. Walks over to me, puts his arms around me, and just starts laughing. <laughs> I laughed too. Mine was a nervous laughter, but... <laughs> but see, I knew my grandfather believed in me. Can I ask you this? Do you believe in your kids? 
Do you believe they're a gift from God? Do you believe that God doesn't play dice with the universe and he gave you those kids? Do you believe that God said, yeah, this one's going to be fiery and this one's going to be completely unlike you, but these are the grandsons and granddaughters I'm giving you. If you and I are going to have a house of legacy, we've got to see those kids the way God sees them. And not only, I'm going to finish with this. And not only do we need to behold them, do not, not only do we need to believe in them, listen to me, we need to bless them. When we bless them, we'll bless them spiritually. Speak it. Lead, listen, lead a house that leads them to Jesus. Have them in a place. That's why we've got our, our children's ministry over here. But listen, don't put that responsibility. Don't say, well, if my son and daughter, grandson and granddaughter are going to come to Jesus, it's going to be because of that church. No, it's going to be because of you. Let them come here and hear the messages that are already being spoken at home. Let them come here and hear the stories that are being spoken already at home. But bring them, lead them in a house to a place that you know is going to be faithful to the Word of God. With our kids, have fun and learn about Jesus. Somebody real spiritual came up to me one time and said, shouldn't it be learn about Jesus and have fun? Listen, if our kids aren't having fun, they're not going to learn about Jesus. We know who our audiences are. We're going to love on them. We're going to have fun. We're going to teach them about Jesus. And parents, I want you to lead them there. So when we bless them, lead your house that way. But listen to me also. The very end of this story, I love it. Jacob, Israel, leans forward to Manasseh. He leans forward to both of the boys. And the scripture says he kisses them and he blesses them. Let me just end with this. You want a house of legacy. Love them spiritually. Love them emotionally. Love them physically. I came from a household. My, my dad, the main dad that kind of raised me, highway patrol, dark jet black eyebrows that met in the middle. There was never a time, never heard the words, I love you. I never heard the words, I'm proud of you. But can I tell you something? When I met my grandfather, his dad, I understood why. That generation just continued. The way that I say that I love you is I put a roof over your head, I put food in your mouth, clothes on your back. That's how I say I love you. Can I tell you something? You and I in this room, do you know that we are made in the image of God? And one of the, part of that means God is Trinity, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, y'all with me? Guess what? So are you. You are body, soul, and spirit. So when, listen, listen, listen. So if we're going to have a house of, leg uh, of legacy, we've got to love, support, see our kids both emotionally, spiritually, and even physically. When Jesus walked up to a leper, a leper, this man's skin is coming off his body. The, the, this man couldn't even walk down the street without ringing a little bell and yelling out, unclean, unclean. This man had not had a physical touch from a normal person in so long. But yet when Jesus walks up to the man, Jesus was going to heal him. Jesus could have just said, be healed. But he didn't. Actually, you know what he did? The scripture says this very pointedly. And Jesus touched Because there's such power in the physical touch. And our children need to experience a safe touch in a strong home where they are believed in. I'm going to ask the worship team if they'll come and join me up here on the platform right now. And I'm going to ask you, church body, will you just real quick as we finish, will you bow your heads with me? I want to simply ask you this right now. Just be still. This is, this is the word Selah in the Old Testament, which just means be still. Let God speak. Right now in this moment as we talk about a 
house of legacy. Whether that's for your children, the children to come. Whether it's spiritual sons and daughters. Whether it's a stepson, stepdaughter, whatever it may be. Right now in the stillness of this place, will you just be still and simply ask God to speak to your heart about legacy? What is it that God wants to speak to your heart right now in this moment?